Hi, my name is Michael Chikin. The smartest people I've met have one common belief, that us silly humans really don't know much. For example, we still don't know why planes stay in the air, or how Tylenol or even gravity works. Yeah, gravity. Look it up. <laughs> in today's distracted, clickbait, misinformation age, I wish we could all be less certain, more humble, and a lot more curious. Admittedly, I've been known to struggle with all three. So no more, no less, this show is my attempt to be that change. Thanks for joining me, and here we go. Hey everybody, welcome back to No More, No Less. I'm Michael Chikin, and today in the virtual studio, I have with me Susanna Bennett. Susie is a research fellow at the Suicidal Behavior Research Lab at the University of Glasgow. Her work focuses on exploring and understanding suicide risk and recovery factors in men. She has done studies synthesizing 20 years of male suicide research, explored help-seeking barriers for men, childhood challenges, and developed an agenda of priorities for male suicide research. Her work has been supported by thousands of men worldwide, sharing their insights and experiences. So today, we're going to dive as deep as we can into what she's found. Susie Bennett, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, giving this work a platform. What I, will, I kind of want to start at the beginning um, for how, I guess, you were influenced or inspired to go in this direction with your, with your research and on this topic. Obviously, it's very, it's very mm. heavy. Um, you know, what, what inspired you to, to learn more about this? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was never something that I anticipated would become the sort of central preoccupation of my existence you know, I'm trying to understand male pain in essence, which is what I, how I think of the work. So I went to, I worked for a long time for NGOs and charities and sort of communication and fundraising roles. And I went back to study really because I was interested in the psychology of how people form their beliefs. And I thought if you could understand those processes, then it will help, it, you know, illuminate a path of how beliefs could be reshaped as well right. um, because your communication work in NGOs was really about trying to get people to care about things. So I went back to study with that kind of purpose in mind and I did a cultural, social and cultural psychology masters and I just fell in love with studying. It was such a relief for my brain to be able to think about things deeply and not have an agenda of an organization that you're working for and I loved it. I was, I was euphoric. I was so happy. And then it came to do my thesis subject. And I just had this feeling, I was so in love with the learning. I just had this feeling that I had to pick a topic that I was equally in love with, hmm. that really spoke to something deep, that was a, a, a question that was critical to my own kind of navigation of life and trying to make sense of, you know, myself and the people around me. And so this was back in 2017 when the Me Too movement was kicking off and there was this huge sort of explosion of uh, conversation around male privilege and, and male power. And at the same time in the UK, there were these statistics around suicide being the biggest killer of men under 50. So all the men that I knew under 50, the thing that was most likely to kill them was suicide. And so these these two ideas of like men having all the privilege and then men dying sort of deaths of despair at such high rates, I just thought there's something in between these two poles. There's this huge missing chunk of the story that I want to understand. And at the same time in my um, personal life, I was had loved ones who really had struggled for a long time with suicidal feelings and suicide attempts. And so a question very central to me in my life was what can bring someone to the point where they're questioning their ability to stay in existence and what more can we collectively do to try and anchor them in a, in a meaningful life? And then, Michael, I couldn't have anticipated what then happened because once I start, so that then became the topic of my thesis, trying to understand male risk and recovery factors for male suicide. And I did 32 interviews with people, with men who'd either attempted 
or people bereaved by male suicide. And those conversations just changed my life. It was so emotional, deeply, deeply emotional, as you can imagine. And also was just a real shedding for me, not just from that moment, but continually through my research, um, sort of seven years later, just a continual shedding of how I sort of understood the world and understood gender relationships and dynamics and understood what it's like for a lot of men to move in the world, which but before my research, I didn't have, I was so ignorant of, even though I was deeply in relation with a lot, with a lot of men. And so it's um, distressing for me to think about the way in which I was socialized to have such little understanding of the true kind of emotional um, experience for for a lot of men. That's a very long winded answer to say that of how I kind of landed up here. But but once I started this work, Michael, it was just I've described it in the past as like a dog picking up a scent in the woods. I just couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. I just was like, there's so much that seems invisible here like so many of the men I spoke to felt so deeply alone with their pain and I found that so distressing because often they would be men that had a lot of people around them you know there was this there was a potential for these huge bonds of care to be activated and yet somehow there was this sort of miscommunication misunderstanding men were allowed to become so isolated in plain sight and um yeah, I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. And now here we are in 2024. Um, wow. Well, I wrote something now you see that to how hard you found it to talk to someone who is questioning their own reason to stay in existence. And like, I think that said, it just kind of hit me like a, like a truck. I didn't even see that, 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 that yeah. coming because that, that really, is the foundation, I suppose, is that you're sitting with yourself in all this pain and you have no outlets, You maybe you have no connection, the connections or you can't feel the connections that you have. And then your question is, well, what is the point of me being here? And I can't think of anything sadder that someone would, would think like that. And you mentioned your own uh, ignorance to not understanding the the male experience, et cetera. And obviously I'm sure, you know, at this point that that's, you know, through no fault of your own. I think that's just the way the world is. It's kind of hard to see outside ourselves, especially across mm. gender lines, unless you happen to have someone very close to you that is constantly reminding you how they live. Like we'd say a, a man who grows up with several sisters or, uh, or, or vice versa. So you can kind of understand what that what that world looks mm. like and i think the feminine mo feminism movement what i think it's done very well over the last 60 some odd years is that it has helped a lot of men at least and people in general understand the plight of women and what they go through and what it's like as lived experience for women i would say me too has done a lot of that for me which i didn't expect mm. that women a lot of women will move in this world with more care or worry for their safety, just walking down the street during the day or at night where I, I I've never, I don't think given it a thought unless, unless mm. I'm in a crazy dangerous city at a crazy night, you know, at the time of day. And so I wonder dur during when you said that you started this research, because it's something you felt very deeply about, was it the conversations you had with those 32 men or was it something else in which you finally thought, oh, wait a minute, I, ha I have something here. Like my hypothesis that there was something missing between this conversation of male privilege and power and that we're all part of this patriarchy and have so many things at our disposal as men, but there's so many men that don't think they deserve to be in existence that they're just ending their lives, which is, I think, such a, a a huge alarm bell that we should all be listening to. And so at what point did you realize like, oh, this is, I've just uncovered 
you know, a, a hundred foot, uh, you know, well on this topic. Mm. I think I had that feeling right at the beginning because I thought it just the divide between those two positions of that sort of of that dialogue of privilege and these, you know, suicide in some ways it's the most it's hard to imagine a bigger manifestation of pain of someone of an of an expression of a deeper pain than to mm. to feel that it's just unbearable to carry on existing and for somebody to get to that point and to also be socially framed as having all the privilege like there's there just there was something in that that just made no no sense to me hmm. and that was really then um the starting point but i couldn't have anticipated going in how much i would um you know uncover i di- i just i was kind of um you know i just was out of the traps and off and it was really michael i have to say it was through the generosity of what was shared with me by those people, not just in that study, but in all the studies. I am really um, moved by the amount of intimacy that gets shared, whether that's in interviews or in um, surveys or messages that people send me. And it's very interesting because we'll talk later about sort of the masculine norms around emotional suppression for example and how that can impact men but at the same time the conversations that I've had with men who are suicidal or have been suicidal have been some of the most emotionally illuminating and rich rich and sort of informative conversations that I've ever had with people I guess as well because when you're in that level of pain there is a huge degree often of reflection internally that comes with it, even if that reflection may feel chaotic or confusing or overwhelming. There is a a need to attend to the pain that's within you and try and in some way make sense of it. And so there's so much wisdom I found in my conversations with men who are suicidal and I think that that's I like to raise that point just because I think that sometimes I mean I identify as someone who has thoughts of suicide and I think sometimes it feels like it's a disempowering thing to admit to people because you'll feel like you're admitting to people I do life not as good as you do because there are times in life where I feel like I don't know that I can keep doing it and so sometimes I think or, you know, we have a very prevailing kind of illness framework that we put on the notion of um, feeling suicidal, which again is kind of a um, disempowering narrative. And I'm in no way saying that if you have thoughts of suicide, you don't need to take them seriously. Absolutely, you have to take them seriously. You have to take responsibility for them. You have to learn how to manage them. But they also can... um, be so instructive because in a way I found the conversations the reasons why people don't want feel like they want to exist anymore tell you in some ways the things that make life meaningful like I've never had a conversation with a man who said to me oh I just wish I had six Ferraris and 200 women to sleep with and holidays in Hawaii you know they they want meaningful connection with people they want a sense of purpose they want a feeling that they have value to others that they're contributing and so you you know all the time it's anchoring you back in what makes life um you know i think ultimately meaningful and purposeful for the for the majority of us right well there's even someone i interviewed not too long ago who uh, a lovely guy anthropologist runs um tribes for men and coaching for men and Mm -hmm. so well intentioned towards his concept of helping men. But one thing that we really disagreed on that spoke to something you just said was that he thinks that men, if they're to be friends or hang out together, 
they have to have a common purpose. They have to be doing this together or that together or join okay. a, a group or have a, a business group together or do uh, a, a, you know, a sport together or something like that. And what I've read and what I agree with is that I think that's why it makes male relationships easier to break down because once you're no longer in that group for right. whatever reason, they, they disappear. And I think that's because after I had that, that idea, I've been speaking to some of my, my older friends at, uh, back in, back in Canada that I've known for 20, 30 years now. And I was just saying how grateful I am for those friendships. Cause the, the four or five of us that are in such close contact, we, we couldn't be more different for things that we like. And the really, the only, some of the only shared things we have are memories from our twenties mm. and that we still appreciate and, and love each other. And mm. so I know that these friendships are not going away in 20 years because it's, it's not based on if we all have million dollar businesses, it's mm -hmm. not based on us all playing in the same football league that, you know, eventually you you age out of those, uh, th those, those activities. Mm -hmm. It's just based on us enjoying being around each other. And I think that's something that a lot of female friendships get right. Yeah. That, yeah. that male friendships I think miss because I think a lot of men feel like they have to be worthy to engage in a friendship. So there's always some sort of, in many ways, a lot of competition that like they have to prove themselves of value to be part of these groups where I think if there are more relational skills that perhaps men can be allowed to have as boys, that we can just throw away this idea of having to earn a friendship and, mm. and just exist in it to accept that connection I, I know these are even things that i that i work on as well trying to just you know not, not trying to manage relationships and just kind of let them let them be but i don't know like as you as you went through a lot of these conversations because i think a lot of men are just looking for people to feel safe around that they mm -hmm. can open up without feeling like they're going to be punished for doing so oh my god yeah. and so i suppose my next question would be where does all of this start? I mean, like, where is the breadcrumb trail come from that goes from a, a healthy, young, happy, emotive young boy to either a, a teen or an adult male who thinks that they should not be in existence anymore? Mm. It's so moving hearing you talk about the idea of friendship. And I just want to say quickly, Obviously, my research is always limited by the fact that I'm a woman. So when I'm having conversations with men, when I'm analysing the data, I'm doing it through a lens of someone biologically female socialised as a woman. And so there's there's aspects of um, the male experience. Sorry, I've got a cat. <laughs> there's aspects of the male experience that I can't um, I can't fully understand. But then there's, as a woman researching the male experience one thing I can do is take things that I hear and filter that through a female lens and so obviously there's lots of men that, that do have very deep loving meaningful friendships but I do speak to other men who describe sort of what you've talked about this feeling of how do you of struggling to find spaces in which they can feel safe and not feel potentially punished or judged for things that they might say and when I take that idea and I filter that through my understanding as a woman I think about how much my mental health relies on the sort of love and support and intimacy and connection that I get from my friendships and I think if I was denied that if I had to do life without that it gives i it's it's almost an unbearable thought because i can i can feel how horrifically horrifically lonely and exhausting and stressful that would be and then you start to think oh my god as a woman i've been socialized to have so much privilege i think potentially in those friendships that i've been sort of culturally facilitated to to have and to access. And I'm not saying that there aren't, you know, biological factors that play into this, but that's not my area of, of research. But it's very, I think when we have that 
conversation, for example, as, as friendship, I would I would encourage women listening to think about what we mean, what the, what are the implications of that for men and for their lives, and um, and how absolutely brutal that can be for for some people. And yet, at the same time, I remember having a conversation early on in my research with the. Uh, a participant who was saying to me, he was talking about the incredible capacity men have to take care of one another. And he was talking, you know, sort of historically about, you know, the wars or like sports teams, as, as you've mentioned, but this propensity to sort of, you know, the most extreme scenarios, put body on the line to protect your brothers and to, to care and be alongside them in huge challenge and to work as a, as a team in a way and I thought that is so striking and where is the space certainly in western cultures for this conversation of brotherhood to happen in a way that we're, we're allowed to have a conversation about sisterhood and for brotherhood to be allowed to be something you know potentially a beautiful resource in the way that sisterhood can be for women. And I'm not saying in any way, Michael, that we go off in separate directions and we, but there is a, a validation and uh, intimacy that we share with people um, that I think it is important to create space for, whilst at the same time doing that really important work as men and women of understanding each other and listening to each other. And I need meant to understand what the experience of for me in the world as a woman is and vice versa right. um yeah, I was so say, you, I, yeah i was gonna say I, I think sometimes it's it's difficult to accept our own our own pain and let's say some of the more difficult parts of life and then not go into this idea that I'm oppressed in the society as a as as a person of any domination, and and then also try to live in your own agency that you can create that change if you want to. I think there's a lot of men that can reach out and be more open and try to connect with other people because it it can be hard as men to connect vulnerably in a way that comes from a really heart centered place. I know even some of the the guys that I'm closest with, I think that's you kind of step into there a little bit, but you don't get too far very often. I've, or I've learned to at least be able to gauge, okay, this friend is just not comfortable in this zone. And so we're going to stay mm -hmm. here. And if I see they're struggling with something, well, then maybe I'll knock on that door and see if they'd like to, to open it. And equally, I probably would share less with that person because I realize that it would make them feel uncomfortable. And I probably also would not get what I needed sharing m more vulnerable parts of myself with that person. It doesn't mean I love them any less. It's just yeah. kind of reading a room. So, but I, so I think this area is kind of difficult for men because you don't know who you can and cannot reach out to. Whereas mm -hmm. women I've spoken to have said quite comically, like, yeah, we start there. <laughs> like we, like we're at, we're at a yoga class, we go out for coffee and then I'm telling them how my boyfriend said something very hurtful to me last night, or my, 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 my mother is sick or, 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 or something like that. And I found that really obviously funny to start, to start there, but also from all the research I've read, this is just how people connect. If you want to be closer with someone more quickly you will just share something more vulnerable and just be open. Mm. And it kind of gives the green flag to say, Absolutely. Oh, this person is open to share and to, to not hide their pain or their shame. And I can have this free flowing exchange of experience and dialogue. I, honestly, I, I, I would speak to our, our, our pre-call that turned into a, a monster conversation that was like, maybe I know boarding in two hours, I had to run to it, to a haircut. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it, uh, you and I exchanged a couple of emails being like how much impacted us in different, in different ways. I thought about it for, for weeks. And mm. I don't think that's possible if both people are hiding behind what yes. they think they have to bring to a conver yes. to a conversation. And I think, 
I think a, a lot of men I've spoken to on this really struggle with that, and I've and, and, and I've seen that. Yeah, and I think it has consequences in so many different directions. But just thinking through, in terms of our research findings, so one area of risk that we find for men is around feelings of failure and feelings like you haven't met the standards of um, success or expectations for what a man should be in, in your society. And those feelings of failure are sort of internalized as something damning of you as an individual. And I think that because women do more of that sharing, like I experience feelings of failure and, and low self-worth, self-esteem, but because I'm speaking to other people in my life, I know it's not unique to me. I know that all of the women in my life are experiencing that as well. So I think I'm less at risk of taking that idea of failure and saying, this is about me. This is something uniquely condemning about Susie as a human being. Whereas men, for example, that aren't doing that sharing, aren't hearing those stories of, of failure and struggle from within their peer group, for example, are more at risk of taking those ideas of those feelings of failure and saying this is about me hmm. um and then also michael it is so exhausting pretending <laughs> it's really tiring and there's another thing that comes up in our research of, of men because it doesn't feel safe to expose their feelings of failure they then for some men will take on this kind of performance of self where they're portraying to portraying to the outside world this sense of being somebody happy in control with their you know life together whereas internally they're having a very very different experience and so not only is it exhausting presenting to the world that you're okay and trying to keep those feelings down but it can be so isolating and distressing right. as that kind of chasm between how the outside world is making sense of you or you think they're making sense of you and how you're feeling um you know on the inside so there's all these different repercussions that come um that may in some ways feed into increasing um men's risk because there is a very gendered aspect to suicide in almost every country in the world where we see men dying at higher rates than women in almost every country in the world and certainly in the UK since suicide records began in 1861 every year since there'd be more male deaths by suicide recorded so there has to be a question about why are men specifically at such particular risk and there are lots of different factors of course that may contribute to that some of which will be you know potentially biological factors um, and some will be potentially around these cultural ideas that everyone is socialized in about who men should be. This is something else that I think is really important is it's not just this work isn't just about men thinking about the implications of those ideas, but all of us thinking through those implications of those ideas. Because certainly that's what I found as a woman doing this research is understanding that the, the way that I've been socialized to think about men I think stop me being curious about them. Stop me being curious in the same way as I was about the women in my life, about what their experience was. Um, right. And that's, you know, it's such a sort of suffocating space for someone to inhabit in when people have stopped being curious about you. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I think we paint caricatures of genders and the drawing becomes even more cartoonish depending of how um, binary you think these genders might be. Whereas I think if they're, because even now I think I think there's a lot of what I would consider gender enforcers in, in media right now where they look at a man or a woman, especially men and say like, well, we asked men and men said this and, mm. and we asked women and women said this. And so this is what, this is exactly what, what things are. And my two issues with that is that when we're trying to look at exactly what is now, we don't think about what should be or what, or what, or what could be. And we're not curious mm. speaking to your, speaking to your point. Whereas, and if you're asking men how they feel, I think it's so funny 
sad but funny because we're asking a large part of the population, which there's enough research out, out there now to say of how many men are disconnected from how they feel. And so they're performing this idea of masculinity of what they should be and completely disconnected for what they want and what they need that yeah. a lot of these surveys probably do not yes. even have the efficacy and the, and the, and the reality that these men are, are facing. And then mm. I also think of if you were to go back to 1950, for example, and you start asking all the little girls in all the little classrooms or even the teenagers, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? I'd love to be a seamstress. Oh, I'd love to work yes. in Macy's. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I'd, I would like to, to be a, a cook or like I, I just want to stay at home. Like there's all of these things and you could say, OK, well, all the women in 1950, they don't yeah. want to be astronauts or researchers or engineers yeah. or, you know, financiers. They just want to do what women do. And people that just want to look at data from that time, you're like, well, why did we why did we let women vote? But the idea mm. is that, like, if, if people can't see what they have the potential to be and they're mm. not allowed to be full human beings, well, then you will never think that you're allowed out of the small little box that society mm. puts you in. And for women, I think it was easier to see because there was very clear oppression limitations in what they are allowed to do in the world and move in the world. And so it's very, I think it's very definable what these problems are. Whereas yeah. with men, it's so much more, I don't know, it's so much more vague to say, well, we have to give men their emotions. We have to give them feelings. It's hard to understand that concept of what is not there. It's hard to understand the absence of something. Yes. And I think that's where we come to all of these gendered arguments that's saying that we're trying to feminize men and all of these things that I think is completely bullshit i think like no yeah. one is trying to turn men into women we're trying to no. let men have what was stolen from them as boys yes. that it's it's stolen so early that we can't really even even see yeah yeah and Michael, so I, yeah go ahead no i was just gonna say i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more and the it's such a violence on some level that's that's done it's such a cultural violence i remember speaking to a man who made an attempt on his life and i remember him saying that he genuinely thought it would be better to die than to tell his wife who he had a really you know strong loving marriage with it would be better to die than to tell his wife how he was feeling wow michael that is I mean, there's not even words to put around it. That is, it is so dangerous. And what a violence to have happened to a human being for their relationship with their emotions to become so um, distant and disconnected and dysregulated in that way. And I really think the more that I'm in this work and the more that you see the ways in which that violence can kind of permeate um men's lives and the and the oppressive um impact of it of having to exist within that um straight jacket and at the same time michael i do want to just go back to that point of well, there's two things i want to say I, again i just want to emphasize the point that that, that Many of the men I speak to are some of the most emotionally articulate and insightful people that I speak to. So even though there is, on this one hand, this disconnect and this dysregulation, there's also this ability to be incredible communicators of feeling and of experience. Um, and I cannot, cannot, cannot emphasize enough my support for the point you made that none of this is about making men more feminine that human beings feel, we feel, you're right. always feeling, whether the feeling is big or small, you're always having some sort of effective response to existence. And that's mm. been going on evolutionary wise for a really long, 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 long time. Absolutely. So giving yourself the tools to try and understand what those feeling states are telling you, what they're telling you that you need, what they're telling you about what's hurting, what they're telling you about what needs to change. 
is about helping you as a human being regulate your existence. Mm -hmm. It's so critical. And the fact that cultures have dislodged, in some instances, you know, half the population from in some ways having as healthy relationship as they could be with that sort of regulatory system, I think is absolutely um, horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, and I read a really interesting book because, Michael, I also think sometimes when these things get talked about, it's almost, there's a tone almost of like men are kind of doing it to themselves, you know, sure. like there's this understanding of like, oh, we get that it's bad for men, but they're kind of doing it to themselves and, you know, it's in their power to, mm -hmm. to change, change things. I read this really interesting book that was hypothesizing how this idea of male emotional suppression kind of culturally evolved. And they were talking about when we moved from sort of, um, sort of more uh, smaller um, farming communities to having big industries and big cities and suddenly big populations together. And there was more like hard industry of people needing to go down the mines or more big sort of, um, scale warfare between groups and so we needed armies they were they were hypothesizing how there was a need then for a population of people to service doing those things there was bodies that needed to go down to the mines and there were bodies that needed to go to war and right. if you're asking bodies to put themselves in situations of danger then it's potentially useful to tell those bodies you don't need to be afraid you don't need to express your pain or vulnerability because it's going to make those bodies kind of more effective in doing those things. Right. And I thought it was so fascinating reading that. I mean, you know, I think there's lots of different complicated things that go into this notion of male emotional suppression, but this understanding of how we as a people collectively potentially have benefited from the emotional exploitation of men through that suppression yes. was really interesting for me and really powerful for me because it was the first time that I'd really read um, an exploration of like male's emotional suppression that was anchoring it, anchoring it, sorry, in a collective responsibility um, and not making it something about men kind of doing, doing to themselves, which, you know, none of us right. sit down and think, Oh, these are the cultural norms that I really want to, um live my life abiding because you know they're things that we inherit we're born into these ideas and often we don't um even have opportunity necessarily to to question them sure well there's i think there's even people that are in the media now well-intentioned um i guess influencers or thought or thought leaders men who really care about men and care about these issues they still end up doubling down on blaming men that they need to do more there's someone he's a professor at i think nyu his name's scott galloway and he's re he's really ch he's out there championing for men he th he thinks men are hurting and he you know he, and he's and he's really trying to help any conversation you see with him talking about um mm. he's more of like a also a professor and a uh, investor and, and things like that. So he, that seems to be more his, um, his area of expertise, but he's been speaking a lot towards men or men that are hurting, et cetera. But every time I see him speak, he just, he continues to double down on this idea that you have to become stronger and wealthy and that's the way out. And, right. and it seems to him just validating what he did to escape some of his pain. Because okay. I've seen him be on talk shows, which for one sentence, he'll say, um, you have to be be strong and wealthy and industrious and productive and all these things. This next sentence, he's talking about how he tends to gravitate more towards men who are softer and caring and understanding. And I'm like, dude, you are so close to getting this. And it's so it's yeah. so sad because he is so well intentioned. But I see this happening mm. all the time. And one thing that you mentioned about, yeah, it is quite complicated from the things I've read as well for why men have disconnected from emotions. There's actually a book I have right here that I, that I think you'd love called uh, Weeping Britannia. And, oh, wow, okay. uh, and the, the concept of it's called a, a portrait of a nation in tears. 
And because this concept yeah. of this, the, the, the stiff upper lip that came yeah. from this colonization time and that if you were filled with emotion, if you're a man or a woman, you were emotionally incontinent in which they would say, and there was such a pride around not having emotion and this idea that if you were more, if you were more emotional, you could not make decisions. Whereas recently mm -hmm. studies have come out to show that like, if we have no emotions, we cannot make decisions, period. This idea of the, the emotionless logical man is the most reasonable is complete and utter bullshit. Like if you get up mm -hmm. in the morning and you don't feel like having eggs, you're going to have cereal. <laughs> mm. If you can't yeah. have those feelings, <laughs> yeah. you don't, you don't know what to, what to really do. And so I guess what I'd like to know is how could, how could any of us help? Like if, if, if we, if men aren't even speaking to their wives, that they're, that they're in this emotional state, how do we ever know that someone is going down this path? How, how, you know, have you, have you found any ways that we can be the last line of defense perhaps to someone who is starting to think about not being around anymore? Mm. It's such a complicated question to ask because there's so many, I mean, suicide in itself, if we think of like a hierarchy of human behavior, like suicide's right at the top in terms of the complexity of factors that contribute to it, because in a hierarchy of human behavior, in terms of consequences for doing that behavior, like suicide is right at the top in terms of consequences for if I do suicide, what that means for me as a biological being. Right. And I think that every story of suicidal pain is so unique. It's a unique, you know, unique story of someone's biological makeup, of their lived experiences, the, the uh, environment they grew up in, what maybe happened in the caregiving home or didn't happen, what happened at school, um, like socioeconomic factors, cultural factors, political factors. There's so many, I think of it as like a cocktail of pain that each of us carry. Everybody's absorbed pain at some point um, in response to the things that have happened to their, in their lives and everybody's cocktail is um, unique. But some of the things that we hear from or that I hear from men in terms of what's helped them in some ways Michael like I I really struggle with the word sort of recovery because I think a lot of men I speak to and I include myself in this as well is that you it's not that you stop ever having thoughts of suicide but what you do is you can learn tools and skills to to manage them and I think that there's a big question around externally what can the people around you and what can we socially and culturally do to help the management of those feelings and then there's also that question of what can I do because I'm the person in it what can I do to manage it as well um, and for every single person that's going to look different there's going to be different things that help you both um, in the short term when you're in the thick of a crisis just manage you moment to moment, getting you kind of one step in front of the other. And then there's right. longer term work that you can do to understand what are the contents of that cocktail of pain that I'm carrying and how can I, how can I reduce the heaviness of that cocktail? Um, but things that we sort of, um, broader kind of ideas that we hear um, are certainly around emotional regulation so learning tools to manage your emotional states, learning to reconnect with what you're feeling, learning to understand what, you know, the experiences in the past, how they may have shaped um, your life now and acting on um, how you're feeling, revising those like negative and painful feelings of self that a lot of, of men who are suicidal can carry. Um, and a lot of that, 
can often happen in peer support groups. So meeting other men who've also had experiences of suicide and being able to um, normalise those feelings um, and take out some of the shame and also encounter like hope-filled role models. So to see yeah. other men potentially a bit further ahead on, on the journey of learning to um, manage those feelings because again especially in the immediate days after a crisis a lot of people may be oscillating between wanting to live and still wanting to die and that can be a very confusing state to be um, moving between but when right. you've got other men that have been in that position and are starting to um, find tool, their own tools for strengthening that muscle of wanting to live then there's a um, I think hope and optimism in that, that um, is so profound. And then also a big thing about finding meaningful connection with other people, whether that's with loved ones or in those sort of peer support communities or um, even through things like nature or music or, or God, but like feeling that... Um, a sense of belonging to to others um, but it is you know i think it's it is well one thing it's it's so individual what will work for um what one person needs but also um we need so much more research to really understand the interventions that are going to work best for how men want to be supported and want to be helped. Right. Um, there's still, for me, a big piece of work that needs to happen around that. Yeah, I, I think there's... Sorry, you cut out a little bit, so I'm trying to see if you were speaking or not. Um, mm. I, I think there's a, lo a lot of moments where if, if you're disconnected from the way that you feel it's hard to know if you're in an environment that, that, that feels good or feels bad. And if that signal is off, then I think we end up staying in situations, relationships, uh, jobs, environments, any of these things that we shouldn't because we're not really connected to our own pain. Yeah. I mean, th there was, there was a moment for, for my whole life, I've mostly been pretty like rosy disposition. Even if I'm going through a crisis, I still feel like Ugh, today was the worst. Tomorrow will be better. It's a sunny day. Yeah. And I always had that. But there were there was at one point in the last several years, there was a period of six months that it was in a situation. And I, I, I started having some thoughts that I think would, would border on suicidal thoughts. And that finally really woke me up to whoa, th this is this is new. It really scared me because I had never heard a voice like that, so to speak, like a, f a feeling in me that that had those, mm. I feel this bad, that there's a serious alarm bell going off. There's a four alarm mm. fire going on inside. And so, and so since that, I've paid a lot more attention to how I feel about my relationships, the things I'm doing, mm -hmm. how I'm acting, um, all, all sorts of things. And I've even noticed that. So I have a lot of family um, in Italy that I've been close to since I was a child. And now that my language skills are quite better, I go over there and it's really enhanced our relationship. And I'll notice now that like, I just like, even though we really don't have much in common aside from history and family, and again, that we love each other and want the best for each other. And I'll just sit in these rooms where we're having lunch and we're talking about nothing and I will just like kind of look at these people and realize that like I belong and that they mm. love me and want the best for me. And it makes me happy to just see them. And it really fills my bucket without anything happening at all. Like they're talking mm. about how they, the, the wine this year wasn't a good crop and, uh, or there's some pol political thing they don't like, and someone's yelling for no reason. And, but like, <laughs> it, it just, yeah. it just makes me super happy to be in those environments. And I think this is something that 
at least from my conversations that I think some men miss just with their friendships or with their families, because I, th I think life does exploit all of us in one way or another. And I think we're all yeah. dealing with, um, to use the, you know, the zeitgeist word trauma that happened in the past, either from whatever, from family, from friends, from your job, from being hit by a car when you're a kid, like all, all, all of these things. And that may lead us to be feeling unsafe and harder to make these connections, to be around people to, because I think to, to feel love, you have to also be able to show love. And if that, if you're afraid to show love because it was never properly accepted or reciprocated, then I think it makes it much more difficult because even people that want to love you, if you don't show them that you love them and that you appreciate them, well, then they don't think that you love them. And then it stops this virtuous cycle and it becomes kind of unsafe for everyone. And it's, it sucks because I think yeah. everyone talks about how much fear and pain there is in the world. And of course that's so true, but I think there's also just so much tapped and untapped love. I know it, it, it sounds like a Beatles song or, you know, like something from star Wars, but like there, there really is so much tapped goodness of the force out there that I think we're not using because we're so scared that it won't be, it, it won't be accepted properly. Like, have you heard any echoes of that in your, in your conversations with men? I think, I mean, you sparked so many thoughts listening to you there. And I think one of the things that's kind of painful about this situation and yet also hopeful is that for me, so much of this is, is anchored in feelings of loneliness and isolation. That for right. me is often the sort of heartbeat of distress. And there may be lots of different um, reasons why somebody is feeling that way. But ultimately, that's kind of the, if it were a chord on the piano, that would be one of the key notes, this notes of, of isolation and loneliness. Right. And then I think, you know, when we talk about diseases like cancer, for example, and the, the, the number of people that die from it, and we don't have a cure for it. And so we have, we have to live with those deaths because we're at the limit currently of what we know about what can heal it. Right. But with something like suicide, when one of the drivers of it is loneliness and there is an abundance of human beings on this planet, an abundance of those who are good and loving and caring and want to... Um, be of service for others and support others the, the the medicine exists in some way I'm not saying that that is the that completely resolves someone's distress but it can certainly um, help soothe it in moments and so for me there's something sort of so tragic and hopeful about that at the same time um, I think those something that we haven't spoken about so far that is really important is childhood experiences and how those can shape our thoughts and feelings about self or shape our understanding of emotions or our ability to regulate our emotions or our ability to perceive others as safe or not. So we've been doing some studies at the moment looking at childhood experiences and how they... Um, relate to, to male risk and so for example something like bullying comes up so often and what bullying does to that young person who's figuring out their sort of sense of safety in the social world and when the feedback that you're getting overwhelmingly is that that social world is a place of violence or a place of rejection or a place of, that's going to be shaming of you and that that seed of an idea then sits in this emerging, developing brain and informs the schema that they then develop around um, relationships with others, either that they are somebody that's not of value to others or, um, you know, rejected by others. So much corrosive damage can um, can be put into young minds. Um, Similarly, um, we found 
a risk factor in relation to having uh, men who are suicidal who experienced emotional neglect and emotional abuse, which I found really moving because I think for boys who were denied some aspects of emotional care in childhood, where do they then get it as adults? In the right. same way, you know, going back to all the things that we've spoken about before, about like the emotionality often a female friendship and the care and love and intimacy and support that exists there. If you're starved of those sort of emotional nutrients as a young boy in the caregiving environment, and then you're socialized as a man to be further starved of them, it's really brutal. And I think that's true in terms mm. of all kind of different variations of childhood challenges. Like Every single one of them seems to elevate suicide risk, whether it was physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, um, or experiences of bullying. So they're, they're all, they all have their place, but these ones seem to be particularly kind of, of elevated risk. But in general, I think there's something that we really have to acknowledge around the interaction between sort of childhood experiences and these cultural norms of masculinity so what happens to a young boy exposed to emotional pain during childhood who's then socialized as a man to deny his pain like for me that's kind of a double jeopardy of right. um, brutality and isolation that's then inflicted um, upon men um, right. Whereas I think also sorry carry on I was going to say, to, and, and to, to your point, and how I think women have better outlets for this, whereas there's so many groups that, that I think men are, are starting to join now, which is which is great, um, and they're being welcomed to, into those rooms. Whereas, you know, women will go to this yoga class or this whatever class, and they'll they'll talk about these things to let out these emotions. And I think regardless of efficacy of whatever the practice might be, someone will put it under a, let's say a spiritual umbrella and some may or may not agree with these, um, you know, uh, protocols. But I think just being in those environments, regardless if someone is swinging a crystal around or giving you a hug, I think you just feel cared for and you yeah. feel like your, your pain is seen and that the world yeah. isn't all danger. And I yeah. think, unfortunately, some men that I think would have more pain to to exercise and emotion to 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 let out, I think they end up in these men groups that continue to tell them, yes, we have to go into the woods and lift logs together. And and I think but again, if somewhere in that protocol of lifting logs and painting each other or whatever if there's an element of care, I think the, the need to belong to speak to your point on, on isolation and loneliness, I think as long as we can find a place for us to belong, I think it, it keeps us wanting to exist. And unfortunately, too many groups for men right now, you can talk about your Andrew Tates or your incel communities or all these more um, corrosive, dangerous sort of groups. I think a lot of men gravitate towards there because this is what we've created for men to gather together with. And I think as we start creating more male spaces that are um, safe and supportive and helpful and, and, and just letting men make their own decisions instead of telling them what they should mm. be and how they should act. Mm. I think all of society is doing that to men. I think a lot of society mm. wants to exploit men, like you said. It doesn't matter if it's um, partners or parents or um, capitalism companies, uh, governments, all of these things, I think, like to use men uh, disposably for their own aims, either to make someone else richer or to win a war or to build something. Like, I think a lot of them are using men disposably. And what I would really love to help men do in some of the work that, I, that I'm doing that we've discussed is that I don't think it's anyone's job to really to tell men what to do. I think if, if we can help men understand what they what they feel 
and what their needs are, I think they will gravitate towards what they want to gravitate towards. I think they will, you know, because I think there are very many different types of men. I do not think that only a progressive man is the right type of man. I think that's also nonsense. Like, I I think there are, you know, quote unquote, you know, man's man, someone that wants to lumberjack, play sports, live in the woods, however you want to create this cartoon character. I think those men are also men. I think gay men are also men. And if we just allow men and teach men or boys that, yeah, if you have a need, then, you know, you can explore that need and, and, and what it is and be supportive of that. But in that, it will also always be hard to manage our emotions. There was a, um, a men's group I was in a couple of years ago and one lovely guy from Mexico, he was saying like, okay, so I'm trying to allow myself to have all of these feelings and I am, but now what the fuck do I do with them? And I think that is the greatest question because it is difficult. There are therapists that say when men or women come to their office, some need tightening and some need loosening. Like this, 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 this is everyone. This is a balance that as humans, we have to struggle with and it's, it's never going to be easy, but it's so much harder when we pretend that these things don't exist. And so Actually, in preparation for this call, I was looking at different suicide rates in different countries between genders and things like that. And I was wondering if you had any insights because it was like it seemed like it was between like three or four on the low end, like men to women, three or four to one, and then seven to one in com- in countries like Russia and Poland. And do you have any insights why? Because it seems cult maybe culturally why there are more suicides in those countries i mean like it does seem like poland and russia would be really pushing the limits on the binary between men and women so it's it kind of speaks to a lot of things that we're saying but i'm wondering if you had any insights on mm. that i mean i haven't done any research on that specifically i could say what i think potentially based on our findings which I would always be interested in what are the cultural norms around male emotions in those contexts? What are the cultural norms around male failure and success? And what are the cultural norms around men's relationship needs in those contexts? So are men allowed to have uh, deep connection um, with their emotions? Is there some... uh, are men allowed to have intimate, meaningful connections with other people? How much rigidity is there around um, ideas of male success? Um, and I would, I would speculate, I don't know, that in those countries there may be, it, using the therapist language of like, I would say that they are potentially those three areas very tightly screwed in terms of what... Um, men are able to be in those spheres um i do just want to say as well because i was thinking this idea of belonging i think it's so it's so vital and i think that we really have to ask ourselves how are we representing masculinity in the public sphere Mm -hmm. i agree with you masculinity is so it's it's a it's such a broad church of so many things and as it should be but when we talk about masculinity in general terms because michael you belong to men i belong to women whether we there's things that we like or dislike about the fact that we belong like that's what happened from how we were you know born and choose to identify that you belong to men right and so For the people that belong to the Church of Men, if the Church of Men is being spoken about in the public sphere as a church full of violent, toxic, dangerous, destructive um, people that want to drag us backwards, then what does that do for all the men that are in that church about their sense of belonging to that church? Does that make sense? And so we have to 
create space. You know, so if somebody, if a preacher comes along and goes, I'm building a new church where you can do A, B, C, and D, and we're going to celebrate masculinity, and then, you know, I can see the temptation to leave that church and go to the one where I'm going to have some sense of potential pride and dignity or somebody that wants to try and give me some of that totally. because all of us need that in in some way and I think that there's a real collective reflection that we need to do about what kind of church of uh, masculinity we're allowing to be in the public sphere and what spaces particularly for young boys we're giving to celebrate their masculinity, to give them hope and optimism and pride about their masculinity, about what masculinity, what role masculinity can play in. Because, Michael, the world's on fire. There's so many challenges that we face, and we now as a species are exposed to them on a level through like our technological advances. We're exposed to them on a level mm. that we didn't have before. So we're more psychologically burdened with this awareness of all the problems that humanity is facing. Mm -hmm. And we need all of our collective, like, brilliance to try and navigate a path out of that. And there has to be some role within that of for what masculinity um, can do, to, which also has to be allowed to be expansive and expressive and different, uh, allow for different, um, you know, very different masculine identities to have a, a place within it. But that, you know, I do think that is um, one of the most harrowing quotes um, that someone has said to me in my research in terms of what participants have said to me is somebody said, when does a young boy deserving of love, care and protection become a man and deserving of none? Right. And I found that, you know, sitting with that quote as a woman... And it was uncomfortable to sit with because you kind of don't want to believe it. But yeah. I found it, as I allowed it to kind of just have space in my, in my mind and just really think through the implications of that and think through, um, you know, the seeds of truth within it, I was like, that is, you know, going to haunt me. <laughs> For the, for the rest of my life. Well, uh, I just found it so powerful. This is kind of where I get to the research I've been doing, and it, it is haunting. Like, I do feel that we rip the heart out of a lot of boys and, 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 mm. and, teenage, and teenage boys. And, and, and I think it, it speak what you're talking about, about how difficult it was for you, who I would consider w way more open-minded on this issue when faced with that quote that we steal these things from um, boys and say that they're not worthy of this care, love and affection when they become men and you struggled with it. And so I yeah. think there is a lot of people and in this, even in this concept of, of feminism of which I would say I am an ally and supporter, but there is something in some part of the zeitgeist of that movement now that I think when you paint this idea of the patriarchy being all bad, like it's an organization, like if you talk about a monarchy, you can speak to the royal family. If you talk about a monarchy in Spain, there's still a king mm. or was, I don't know, but like they had, they had a king at some point. And, but when you think of it, it's when it's like something, but there's no face to that thing. I think you start putting the face of every man, you know, on that idea of patriarchy and so you think every man is perpetrating this thing and i think even the more maybe astute part of the feminist movement would know that men are also burned and hurt by this system but also when you hear something that men are being aggrieved i think it becomes too hard to accept because you've been told that all these men are the oppressors for so long and that they have the power and that they have all the agency and then they're controlling what we're able to do. And there is truth to that, but it isn't, it definitely is not all men. And so when you hear that boys are being robbed of their hearts, which obviously we shouldn't be surprised how so many men turn out angry alone, um, a very small amount, but 
you know, too many perpetrating violence, it's hard to understand that they need empathy as well. And that's the only way I think through this moment that I think men also need to have their own own emotional needs based revolution to be able to mm. have their feelings to have their friends to have this love mm. that I think even many women I think are perpetrating this idea that men don't have these needs because they were taught mm. that they that they don't and that they should be partnered with a man who is a man who doesn't have needs which like and it's I don't think it's really anyone's fault I don't think there's any blame and I struggle yeah. with this as well I think it's just this is the world that we happen to be in for so many different factors right now. And I think the only way through is for to all of us to understand that we have needs and that, yeah. like you said, we in this body as a human being, emotions are just part of it. <laughs> and yes. if we don't yeah, yeah. Need, learn to accept them and work with them, well, then they're going to kind of run the ship on their own. And that never works out well. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And I think that something that's been useful for me in my research, that I really encourage anybody listening to think about whatever your gender identity is, is when you're looking at men, I think there were periods of my, my life when, let's say, the telescope that I was looking at men through had a lens of it of the worst men that I've known. And that's how I would look at men through the, the telescopic lens of the worst men that I knew. Wow. And when I started to turn that telescope around the other way and started putting on at the front the lens of the best men that I've known, it totally changed my perspective. When I started to anchor myself in the thought, in the reflection of who would I be without the best men that have happened to me, Michael, I don't know that I would be here honestly, because wow. the, it makes me, um, it makes me emotional because I think that we, there's so much um, love and care and protection that so many of us, our lives have been imbued with that have come from the men in our life, which isn't to say that as well, there's not been hurt and pain also, in, you know, some of the, terrible things inflicted on us but it's like we we can render invisible all of that beauty that's been given to us um through the men in our lives and kind of it you know I think it can be so so dangerous so for me that's been really an uh, a powerful reflection to kind of to do yeah, I think we could probably do that on both sides of the aisles. Like, I'm sure if you have um, yeah. the gender dial, if you will, I'm, I'm sure a lot of these incels uh, and people that have removed themselves from the dating pool or from um, collaborating with women have probably equally been hurt by many women uh, in their lives that they find very unsafe or violent or abusive and all of these things. And it's hard when when... And for women, I'm sure, like when many of your experiences, most of the most profound um, traumatic experience of your life has come at the hand of yes. a, an abusive man or a neglectful man or an avoidant man or all of these things. And then you're asked to have sympathy for men. And you're like, but all the ones I know suck. Yeah. It would be very difficult. And I'm sure, you know, men have the same experience with the more dangerous women that they've, they've, they've come yeah. across. And I, I don't know where to go from there. Cause it, it's, it, it is hard to tell someone when 90% of your experience with this one specific type of person has been dangerous to you, has been a threat to you, but have faith. There's better ones out there. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't expect them to believe me because like mm. learned experience is, is where we have to go by. And so I think, I think maybe that's one part of social media that could be helpful that there are accounts out there now that put like positive masculinity out into the world that you can see how many different types of men and women are out there. And some are open and caring and supportive and vulnerable and strong and all of these things. And so I think hopefully it can give us more faith that 
our negative experiences are not the sum of humanity, which it's a bit of a leap to get to, to, to get there. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but I, but I think if we can see some of it, it allows us to make that jump a little bit. And I wanted to take a step to um, into a, a part of our conversation we had in our pre-call um, that you said some of these main risk factors that you found um, for suicide and a lot of men had to do with three uh, Ds. Mm. And, and and I was hoping you could explain to us a, a little bit about what you've what you found and to to kind of shine a shine a light of what maybe we can try to notice through through other people and maybe you know lend mm. a hand. So one of our studies we did was a big synthesis of 20 years worth of research into male suicide. So we, we got 78 papers that have been written on male suicide and we explored them for sort of common patterns in relation to risk factors and recovery factors. And in terms of the risk factors, we developed a model called the 3D risk, which is around how cultural norms of masculinity seem to impact what we call denial, disconnection, and dysregulation in three psychological domains. So denial, disconnection, and dysregulation. And the interaction of the harms of those um, disconnection and dysregulation in, in those three psychological domains seem to interact and increase uh, men's suicidal pain. So the first psychological de domain was around men's emotions. So how men are, uh, the cultural norms around men denying their emotions, for some men then becoming disconnected from their feelings. So not even knowing for themselves necessarily what they're feeling because they become sort of so shut down to it. Then also impacting um, or, or minimizing their ability to feel safe in expressing those emotions. Um, which can be an important tool for, for regulating feelings, to be able to understand for yourself what's going on and then also communicating that to people that may need to know. So then we start to see some dysregulation emerging. And as pain in life builds, certain men looking for pain relief strategies. And if the pain relief strategies of expressing your emotions have been closed off to you and pain relief strategies of you know, sort of intimate connection with other people have been closed off to for you, then um, some of the men were sort of looking for alternative strategies such as drinking, drugs, gambling, sex, self-harm. These things, behaviours were described as creating short-term relief for pain, but obviously over the long term can just end up elevating that pain and causing more of this sort of dysregulation. Right. So that was some of the things that we ha saw happening in, the domain of emotions. The second area was around men's thoughts and feelings towards themselves. So things that we've discussed already in this call around ideas of failure. So men having this really strong sense of what it means to be a successful man and a strong sense of knowing whether they were achieving that or not. And how catastrophic for some men these feelings of failure could be if they felt they weren't achieving those markers. And it could be in all different domains, so like job, um, finance, sex and relationships, exams, different areas of life, but the same sort of pattern of feeling like you weren't living up to expectations and this sort of these painful ideas and feelings of self that then come as a consequence. Mm. And then this sort of disconnection that some men do from their selfhoods and the authentic self by presenting it to the world, this external self of somebody coping and happy and functioning. Right. And so that sort of dysregulation that can then come into your, the relationship that you have with yourself. And in both the domains of emotions and self, we would also see how experiences in childhood could additionally elevate risk in those areas. So if you grow up in a um, context where there's a lot of abuse or neglect um, or bullying or violence, it's going to shape potentially from a young age how you regulate your emotions and your thoughts and feelings about yourself. Um, and then the third psychological domain was around men's relationship needs. 
So you've got emotions, thoughts and feelings of self, and then men's relationships with others and how cultural norms potentially deny and diminish some men's relationship needs. Right. So cultural norms that you need to suppress your emotions, cultural norms about you need to be independent and stay in control. All of those norms can impact then how you relate to other people. They can impact and narrow the spaces for intimate connection. If I'm being culturally told to not share my feelings, it puts, you know, it, it diminishes and narrows the space that I have to build kind of potential intimate connection with other people. The same around, um, you know, these ideas of, of independence and self-reliance. And I'm not saying that there aren't also important qualities in those ideas, but when taken to an extreme, it can become... Um, potentially unhealthy and so we saw here evidence of men feeling as as we've spoken about already like incredible isolation incredible loneliness experiencing challenges in their relationships challenges um relationship breakdowns trust issues um and so this sort of dysregulation emerging then in their in this psychological domain of connection with others um so that's the kind of 3D model. So this, so denial, disconnection, dysregulation in the psychological domain of emotions, thoughts and feelings of self in connections with others and how those things interact. If I feel like a failure and I'm then being told to suppress those emotions, it's then creating even more distance from my relationship with other people. So it's not that those three things are necessarily acting in isolation. And our hypothesis is, is that those three psychological domains and that sort of 3D um, disconnect, uh, denial, disconnect and dysregulation is potentially active in suicidal crisis, irrespective of your gender, that somehow that those are the th- potentially three core psychological tectonic plates that right. when they are shifting in that dysregulated way, can cause a potential sort of suicidal earthquake. But what we hypothesize is because of the way that men are socialized in certain cultures, they inherit more cultural harm, more cultural risk because of cultural norms about masculinity relating to those Hmm. um, three domains. Now, also, of course, there will be biological factors that are contributing to this. I'm not saying that this model explains everything. But for us, we think that's potentially a useful framework for understanding how culture and gendered ideas may elevate um, some men's risk. So I think it's really important to be reflecting on how do I regulate my emotions? You know, how do I regulate my thoughts and feelings of self? Where do my ideas of success and failure come from? And do I really believe in those ideas? Do they really have meaningful value for me as an individual? Or is it what I feel is expected of me? What space is there in my relationships to be like intimately and meaningfully known? How can I cultivate those spaces where there's more, you know, opportunity for that? And also for us in relation to people that may be, um, in suicidal crisis, how we are also reciprocating the the invitation for that um, emotional sharing, grounding somebody in a sense of value about who they are, creating space for intimate uh, connection. And it's not always, these things can't happen overnight, you know, like I... um, I had really high emotional suppression for a long period of my life. And when I first went into therapy, I remember saying to my therapist, and I was sort of 30 at the time, I was like, I feel like I'm using the muscles in my throat for the first time. It's like I'm learning to speak. And I had to build my language of emotional fluency, like bit by bit. It wasn't that like, you know, and I think there's a danger in these conversations that somehow sometimes we may mythologize women's emotionality as if there's some, they're the sort of gold standard of, 
But a lot of women, myself included, have a lot of work to do still about how we regulate our own emotions as well. So it's, um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. It's kind of on, on all sides. I mean, for emotional regulation, it, it's, it, it is comical for us to say that like, oh no, most men don't have emotions. Have we just dismissed anger as an emotion? Like if that's yeah. the only anger, if, if anger is one of the only emotions we're allowing men to have, and that's what they're showing, well, that's that's quite emotional. And if the and you have these yeah. explosive behaviors from both genders that you know that cannot self-regulate, that cannot understand what their needs yes. are, that cannot communicate. Maybe they don't yeah. have the the language or the experience and and all of these things. But something I wanted to to go back to that you touched on is like. Uh, gambling and drugs and, and things like that, that I think far too many men go down mm. the, the road of for these, like you said, many deaths of despair. And mm. I think from what I've read that a lot of men present depression differently than women. And unfortunately, we're using the female model of depression mm -hmm. from which to diagnose people. And, mm -hmm. and I think so if we think someone is doing all the drugs and drinking themselves to death sometimes. And, and we're thinking that, Oh, they're just an addict or, Oh, they just had a problem. But there's an author uh, from the UK, actually, I think Johan uh, Hari or, or Harari, he wrote a book called lost connections. And he says that the opposite mm. of depression is not happiness. The opposite of depression is connection. Mm. And so m my th thought on that is that, if men are going down these roads of gambling and drinking and all of these things, yeah, they, they've probably become addicts because that's what these substances do, but it started somewhere. Did it start yeah. from an emotionally or physically abusive um, caregivers or a romantic partner or someone that they had in their life that was the closest to them that just didn't give them the love that they needed and it was and it was toxic in a way like th there's so many ways for us to look at that. And some of the ways that I think about it is that if our whole life we're pretending that our emotions don't exist and we just stuff them down and we put them into this dungeon and we lock them away because men aren't allowed to have emotions or, or anyone women suppress as well. Um, but inside that dungeon is a dragon that every time you put emotion in there, you're just feeding that dragon more and more and more. And in my opinion, at some point, it just will burn your whole life down. It doesn't matter if it's in that dungeon, it's going to, it's going to melt every rock. Mm. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people that they think that they're being strong by suppressing this emotion. They can be more logical if they don't feel, but then the emotion is still running the show. We just don't have yeah. access to be able to control the impetus of things that we're doing. And then we're wondering like, well, why am I, burning down all these relationships? Why am I self-sabotaging? Why am I doing all these? Well, the answer is that there's something that we are not at all dealing with. And so you said it, it is, obviously it is very complex for us to figure out where are the inputs and outputs for this. But I think for, for people like yourself that are paying attention, I think there is a pretty strong string theory case across this, that this concept of this modern idea of, I mean, modern, like the last hundred years of masculinity is, is terribly hurting boys and it's terribly hurting men. And if, if seven to one in some countries, men are killing themselves, we have to think what's happening to all the men that don't get to the point where they do actually kill themselves. Like, like what are they doing to cope with all that pain? And who are they hurting in their life because they maybe they haven't decided to hurt themselves. There's no way that they're not also hurting everyone in their life and not just through outward actions, but also through them shutting down and not maybe showing their children love, not showing their partners and fa family love. Like it just goes so broad and so deep that I'm sure you are going to be able to research this for as long as you as as you as you want to, because uh, it it definitely needs a voice, and I'm so glad that that you're one of those. 
I mean, I, I think that sort of what I said at the beginning, in a way, I, I study human, I study male pain made manifest in suicide, but there are many ways that that pain could be made manifest in people in men that will never attempt suicide, right. but they may have addiction problems or, and I think this work of like really starting to see those behaviors as pain relief behaviors, behaviors driven by somebody desperately trying to find ways to cope and regulate the enormous pain that they are um, experiencing. Um, I think that, I mean, in terms of emotional suppression, I remember a man saying to me that like, suppression is the cope like that is the way it, the one area in his life that he has available to him to like exercise some control and so that was like the way in which he oh. sort of almost like lifting going to the gym and just like lifting massive weights and like it like that was how he um survived and I do think that there is I cannot tell, I do not know the amount of pain that another human being is in. And mm. I cannot tell when the moment is going to be safe for them to start unpacking that emotion. And so there does have to be some uh, respect for knowing for yourself, I suppose, when you're going to have the when you feel you have the capacity and resources to do that, sometimes it's because you've reached rock bottom and you've got nowhere else to go. And I do notice a difference in a way in conversations with men who've attempted suicide than men that haven't, in the sense that men that have attempted sometimes seem to be more open open-minded about what those regulation tools might look like because they understand the ones that they used in the past put them in such profound danger and so it almost wow. becomes after the attempt a, a, a sort of internal surrender from those past coping strategies for, for some men um and the other thing I wanted to mention you were sort of talking about we don't necessarily understand how depression presents in men I think in, in the same way there's work that we're doing at the moment to try and work with health professionals to, to um, upskill them in how they um, in their understanding of, of like male suicide risk factors because we do also see evidence of men who've reported going to the doctors for example and then being highly suicidal, but expressing it in very matter-of-fact tones. And so a doctor who's trained to or, or understands that um, or believes that sort of distress should present as somebody, you know, out of control, on the edge, in a sort of hysterical state, right. would mis potentially misread this man of not being at a elevated point of crisis because he's not presenting his distress in the way that um, where maybe all of us socialize to um, experience it as. Right. So this is why also going back to a point I made earlier about when we talk about cultural norms of masculinity, it's not just about how they impact men, but how they impact, you know, sort of all of us right. in terms of like understanding how distress might present in men and how that might look differently to how distress presents in, in other people. Right. Yeah, th I think that's probably one of the more difficult ones to identify when someone is hurting and then how to reach out to them. And like you were saying earlier, uh, it's it's difficult because if someone's not going to admit there's a problem, uh, if you can't accept your own feelings, which is this kind of the central I issue here, then why would you accept help for an issue you can't accept that you have? And so I think we can probably look at the idea of addiction in that or gambling that like, you know, I don't have a problem. I'm fine. And you're just going to get rid of everyone in your life that you think is telling you of a problem you don't have because they're mischaracterizing you yeah. when that that concern is, you know, legitimate or just coming from a place of of, of love. And so the only time you're going to accept any sort of help is when you probably get low enough 
that their alarm bell goes off to say, oh my gosh, I've, I've, I've woken or I've been arrested or I've, I've hurt somebody mm. irrevocably, um, emotionally or physically. And you have to face the reality of your life choices. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think that's, that's the hardest part for, because what you said to me on, on our previous call is that to speak to these families that are widowed or left behind by uh, by men who have committed suicide, that's where the reality of this really lies and, and how it affects everyone. Because I, I'm sure I can't imagine that for their lifetime, these families will consider, continue to think, what could I have done? How did I miss these, this warning signs of which there might have been none? Um, and, and so I, I don't, I don't know, I, I guess, is there a place I guess I need to wrap up, I want to be respectful of your time. Is there, is there anything that we, that we can do on the other side of this when it becomes a real issue? Or is the only solution to work with boys and teenagers and to try to fortify the reserves of love at those points before it gets there. And then when it, or because when it's too late, there's nothing that we can, can do. I don't know. What, what do you think? Um, I think it needs to, it's a, it's a, a multifactorial problem that needs a multifactorial solution. So exactly what you've described about from sort of upstream when, you know, what we, the, the values and safety and support that we're giving young boys um, is an absolute critical factor, as well as the interventions that we're developing to support men in immediate crisis right now. And so there's a whole spectrum of changes and support. And some of it is so deep, Michael, in terms of, and in some ways there's agency for us in all of that because it's deep, because it's deep in terms of it's deeply internalized in the minds of each of us, these ideas and expectations of men. But there's also agency in that because it's within you. So you have that opportunity to be excavating those ideas you hold, those biases you might hold about men and masculinity. And even I now, as somebody, you know, I do, you know, I try, I want to come alongside men as safely and compassionately as I can. But even, even now, me with the level of exposure that I ha I've had through this work, still find moments of life where I go, oh, I've hit, I've hit an, inter an eternalized bias has just surfaced that I didn't even know I had. And so we're right. all carrying around these things. Um, and so we all have a both, I think, kind of a responsibility if we want to be um, in compassionate relation with one another, a responsibility to excavate what these um, ideas and biases might be and how they may be acting upon the relationships that we have with men in our in our lives, but I also, you know, we ha I ha also have to be honest about for anyone listening who's either in a suicidal crisis themselves or worrying about somebody who who is. And I've been to on both sides of that coin, and it can be absolutely brutal, absolutely brutal. And I wish that I could offer very sort of simple, surefire ways in which somebody's safety can be guaranteed. And I don't have that. But I do know that, that love is one of the best medicines that we have. And to keep kind of leaning into that um, love for each other, But I wish that there were, um, you know, there's so many, it, the roots of this can run so deep that I was even thinking as you were talking about addiction, that 
when we think of that as kind of like a pain relief behavior, so I have a migraine condition and I take certain migraine tablets for it. And if somebody said to me, you can't have those anymore, you can't take them, I would, I don't know what I would do. I need them to ease my pain. I've still got my migraine. And now you're taking the thing that helps me medicate it away. And in the, in the same ways, I think sometimes with addiction, when we're not resolve it, like the addiction is a response often to something, to right. some sort of, uh, you know, migraine equivalent in somebody's life. And if we're trying to take away their pain relief method and not resolving the thing that's causing the pain, it's not a sustainable kind of solution sometimes. Um does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The like I think we, we all cope in so many different ways. You know, it can be drugs, alcohol, sex, food, food, food. <laughs> you know, like there, there yeah. there's there, there there's so many different ways that we can try to feel better. And that, that's someone had a point about the all these um Ozempic weight loss pills now, is that like if people now are taking these pills which are working and allowing people to shut off some of the addiction center in their brain that has them coping with food or even other substances, they say, well, then will people have to face those feelings for what the underlying truth of their emotional state is? Or is there going to be a huge tick uptick in ep- epidemic in um, opioid uh, crises or um, right. or, or gambling or drugs. And, and that's a question that people are purporting now being like, well, if everyone's losing all this weight, because it's cutting off appetite for everybody, then will we actually start wrestling with what's really underlying? Or are we going to find more outlets? And, I, and no one really knows um, the issue right now. And I think you've kind of focused on that and saying, yeah, if, 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 if there's so much pain, then we, we're, we're going to try to find a way to get rid of it. And if the pain is so profound that let's say it comes from childhood and you have no mm. outlets for it, you have no connection, you have no ability to create connection, you have no ability to vocalize and share that, well then... The, maybe the end is just thinking not being here is better than being here because being here is so desperately painful and, and, and empty. And mm. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think ever since our first chat and all the research I've been doing that I, I just want to try to make the people in my life, men and women feel as safe and loved by me as I actually Absolutely. feel towards them. Because I think yeah. that's something that I've, I've missed in some relationships that, that I, that I yeah. now regret that um, people I've really cared for, but because of the dynamic for how you understand the relationship, there's not a path for that. And I, I've just thrown that out the window now. I'm just being like, if, if I feel that I genuinely care for someone, I'm gonna make sure that they know that and not yes. all the time i'm not going to send them flowers and i love yous to, to my to my buddies every time we go out and and play basketball but like i, I want to make sure that that foundation is there because i think that is just insanely important and if i don't feel that then then i actually have to think oh is this a friend that i that i want to spend this much time with or is there something here that maybe is not good for me and that's been a that's been a really helpful change but i don't know i'm just i just want to say thank you for all of your insights uh on this i know I'm, i'll think for this conversation for another few weeks just like after the last one um <laughs> and um i think it's such important work that i think a lot of people dismiss so uh on behalf of a lot of people that i think in the future your work will help i i want to say thanks that's beautiful. And thank you for what you just described then about the changes that you've made in your own life. I think that's exactly, that in some ways is the, it's the best gift that we have. That that love is such 
um, exquisite medicine and it's not always enough but to keep giving it in the spaces where you feel safe to give it um, you know is so important and I think those things that also those areas of emotional regulation, thoughts and feelings of self, connections with others, those are all areas where even if you've experienced huge barriers in your ability to regulate those areas, they are all areas of life that with, with time, your muscles of uh, agency and effectiveness in those domains can be built up. There is that um, possibility for a different future for people. And there are so, I know that often, you know, we've spoken a lot about isolation and loneliness, but there are so many people that care deeply about this issue. Like the fact that we're having this conversation now, I work with a lot of um, colleagues around the world that are also um, working on this issue, that care deeply about this issue. The amount of men that participate in my research, not necessarily in the hopes that it's gonna help them, but that it's going to help other men and the amount of um, mothers and part and girlfriends and wives that get in touch with me that want to know more about this issue because they care about the men in their lives. So there is this, this huge ocean of care around this topic as well that does, um, you know, exist. And I'm, mm. I hope that we, I'm glad to be a part of those waters with so many, you know, really exceptional and, compassionate people that's great well you cut it again there you go well okay. um thanks a lot for your time today okay. and we'll be in touch thanks michael Bye -bye. take care so thanks for listening to no more no less i appreciate the time you spent with me today so please subscribe and rate the show if you enjoyed it it'll help me create more amazing content and get that next little bit of validation that i so deeply crave if you didn't enjoy it, well, that sucks. But to make sure, I think you should listen to my next 10 episodes and then decide. I mean, come on. Rome was not built in a day. I'm just getting warmed up here, guys. So thanks again. See you next time.